Welcome to Open Studio on Brattleboro Community Television. My name is Chris Lenoir, and today we are speaking with Sue Minter. She is the former secretary for the Vermont Department of Transportation, among other titles, <laughs> and currently a candidate for governor running against Matt Dunn and Peter Galbraith in the Democratic primary. Welcome, Sue. Thanks for having me, Chris. Now, I know you've also been a state representative, but it was at the Wyndham County Democratic Committee Candidates Forum that we held in Brattleboro back on June 6th that the media panelists and I all had a chance to talk afterwards about the different candidates and their responses, and we all agreed that a lot of your responses to the questions demonstrated your administrative experience. So I want to ta start talking about that. It's obviously a difference between you and the other two candidates, the role that you've served in the Shumlin administration, but how do you think it translates into being a better governor than either Matt Dunn or Peter Galbraith? Well, thanks for that question. It's true, I'm really the only candidate who has this unique qualifications of both serving in the legislature where I was elected to four terms. I served six years, but then was appointed to be first the deputy and then the secretary of the transportation agency. So that combination of legislative and executive branch experience, not just thinking about policy and creating uh, the opportunity to pass important legislation, but then knowing how to implement it. I've been Running, uh, as Secretary of the Transportation Agency, I've been running the second largest agency in our state. That's uh, managing a workforce of 1,300 people and balancing a $600 million budget. So it takes a lot to understand governance and how to actually make government work for people. And on top of that, in the middle of my tenure, uh, I was caught in the eye of Tropical Storm Irene. And it was our job at the agency to mobilize quickly in this crisis and to uh, come up with a team, to innovate, to partner, and to actually do what few people th thought possible, get over 500 miles of road and hundreds of bridges put back together so we could reconnect our communities and keep our state open and open for business. Now, a lot of people will look at the governor and think about their agenda and what they propose to the legislature, state of the state, how they set priorities at the beginning of each of the legislative sessions. That's a little different than the role as an administrator where you're managing the day to day. Do you see yourself in one role or another in terms of how you would be a governor? Well, you've got to be able to do both. You have to be a leader with real ideas of how you want to move the state forward, the vision, but then you have to have those skills of working in partnership with the legislature, helping them to understand your aspirations communicating well with the voters. And yes, it's critical to be able to make government function, to make it accountable and transparent. Uh, and I certainly have a very ambitious agenda in both directions. Now, uh, let's uh, want to get into some of that uh, agenda that you have, but I also wanted to give you a chance to talk about it in the context of the governor that you were serving under mm -hmm. as administration uh, of the secretary, excuse me, of transportation. Um, and that's Governor Shumlin, who a lot of people thought was very much a visionary governor in terms of some of the things he put forth with regards to uh, universal pre-K, his attempts at universal, universal health care. Uh, do you see your agenda being similarly visionary as a continuation of what Governor Shumlin was trying to do? I think that I will have different priorities than uh, the current governor, um, and I will say one of the most critical ones that will be a continuation of his work was in opiate addiction and really facing what a crisis we have with respect to people and addiction and rising addiction rates to opiates. Uh, I think the governor was commended, uh, should be commended for raising this issue, which in fact is now a discussion nationally, because it takes leadership to help raise the tough issues, but then to bring people together to solve them. Uh, with respect to opiates, I actually think my experience in Irene managing in a crisis is very relevant to how I need to govern in this crisis. And frankly, the many critical challenges we faces, face. But as an example, I plan to appoint an opiate uh, manager, opiate crisis manager as a top leader in my governor's office, just as I was for the Irene Recovery Office, which I took on after four months. After we'd gotten the roads fixed, I then was asked to be Irene Recovery Officer, and my work went from looking at roads and bridges and helping towns to looking holistically at the state, at thousands of homeowners, communities, businesses, uh, and setting a path for the future. 
The same thing needs to have that level of focus in the governor's office for opiates. So my uh, opiate crisis manager will, in fact, be thinking 24-7 about the magnitude of this crisis just as I did as Irene Recovery Officer. But when you're in the governor's office, you can think around all of the different parts of government. You know, what I learned being in the executive branch is that we've got to break down the silos that separate the different agencies and come together as a team because problems are very multifaceted, particularly issues around opiate and substance abuse, domestic violence. They're all connected and they need to be thought about in a collective way. That's what my crisis, opiate crisis manager will be able to do. Think around not just all of the places of government, but the nonprofit organizations, the doctors, the prescribing habits, uh, even the uh, pharmaceutical industry that are creating these opiates. We we need to think very broadly, and we need to have someone whose job it is 24-7 to be able to reach out and pull together and make a difference to get on top of this crisis. It's affecting every community in our state, and if we don't get on top of it, it's going to overtake us. Now, you just brought up a number of different things that this crisis manager would oversee. One of the things I didn't hear there was law enforcement. And certainly, Governor Shumlin, I think, did the right thing by characterizing the opiate addiction problem as a health care problem and as something that can be addressed there. But there's still a law enforcement aspect to this. Absolutely. And I want to tell you, I've been traveling around the state seeing how the different communities are approaching this crisis. And I really want to point out Rutland as a shining example of a very innovative and important way of for the law enforcement um, division of the city is actually co-located in the community policing office. There are folks from probation and parole, from mental health services and social services, from domestic violence prevention, and they work as a team. Just as I'm saying, we need to think as a state as a whole. And when you work as a team, you can actually hit the challenge in the right spot. For example, a community police officer I was speaking with was saying, you know, now when they get a call from a particular home they, who, where someone may be off their meds, instead of sending a police officer to exacerbate a situation, they know to call the mental health counselor, the community service provider, and help prevent any escalation that can happen. You know, our, uh, community, our enforcement officers have an eye on the people who they may know be at risk, or areas of the city, and they're keeping real data. Anyway, that's a wonderful example of a, of a model. Uh, it's not going to be the same in every community, because every size and every culture of community is different, but we have to be not just community by community, but we all as communities need to be coordinated and discussing and innovating together. That's how we got through Irene. Thousands and thousands of Vermonters helping one another, coming together with a common mission. That's what's happening in Rutland around getting on top of substance abuse and domestic violence. That's what we need to do as a state on this challenge and many more. So you, the, the crisis manager, the experience that they would need to have to fill that role wouldn't necessarily all be clinical or medical related. You would want them to have some administrative to look at also breaking down this law enforcement silo and, and bringing it under the same umbrella. Absolutely. And having that team approach. So it's a person who understands the medical side and communicates with the medical side, yeah. but as much someone who is a collaborator and who can see holistically. That's what's needed. And someone who is all the time focused on this and part of a national dialogue that we're having as well. Yeah. One of the things that you certainly have a lot of experience in as the Transportation Secretary is infrastructure. Uh, and on your website, you have the Invest Vermont Plan, a public-private investment program to grow Vermont downtowns and regional centers. Now, when I read the plan, I did think to myself, now there's a faction of Vermonters, and, and some of them are democratically inclined at that, uh, that might hear that and think, you're out to change that rural character of the state of Vermont. When you talk about downtowns, regional centers, I think that's the, the operative word there. I'm sure that's not what you mean. You still think the Green Mountain State is a green state and very agrarian. 
So absolutely, um, Invest VT is also with Innovate VT, but let's talk about Invest VT yeah. first because you're right. You know, I'm a planner. I've been focused on implementing our land use plan of growing our compact centers, our downtowns, our villages, surrounded by the working landscape and very much the rural landscape and how we make sure innovation and opportunity grows there is just as important. But we'll get to that when we talk about Innovate. But why I think infrastructure is so important. I certainly learned both as a legislator uh, on the Transportation Committee, but then as secretary, that we have really been underinvesting for a generation in critical infrastructure that's absolutely essential to the foundation for economic growth. So I am all about focusing growth and opportunity in our downtowns, our villages, and yes, our regional growth areas, but also that's coupled with how do we continue to grow and sustain what we all love about Vermont, the rural working landscape. And that's really about one of the key four sectors that I talk about in my Innovate Vermont program, the agricultural industry and the forest products industry. You know, we've had an amazing, of course, our dairy industry is really the critical driver of our Vermont economy still, our Vermont agricultural economy. But we've also had a virtual renaissance of local foods and new food producers um, from the farm to plate uh, bill that I was in the legislature with and helped uh, pass and now seeing what's happening in an absolute explosion. That is where we need more innovation and opportunity to help new businesses uh, scale up or start up and then scale up. And I also want to mention the forest products industry. We don't want to leave our forests that can be turned into real great Vermont products uh, without an, a plan to help sustainable forestry move to product and economic opportunity. Well, it's good that you mentioned forest products here in Wyndham County, mm -hmm. uh, where we have a, a lot of opportunity to do that, say some other types of innovation. And, and with that Innovate Vermont plan, and then also that point you just made about in the first year of office, you're gonna identify these three communities for economic stimulus. That's actually something I pulled right off your website and wanted to ask you. It sounds like you have worked out some criteria for that, mm -hmm. uh, because there's a couple different ways you could go with something like that, right? You could help somebody who's completely bottomed out, the Barry example that you gave, or a town or or community that's kind of just needs that little push to get a little extra way there, mm -hmm. uh, which some might, people might argue is a better way to leverage available dollars. So I think, uh, especially as I've been traveling in Wyndham County, Bendington County, uh, really the southern part of our state, reading the Southern Vermont Economic Development Zone uh, report, uh, I know that there are parts of our state that are really uh, stagnant economically. And I will say that uh, economic stagnation and challenge is probably going to be one of the key criteria that I will be looking towards. But just as important is a plan and a community with champions, with leadership, uh, that are ready to really roll up their sleeves and move forward. Uh, my own community of Waterbury was really wiped out after Irene. Uh, it was a virtual ghost town. Uh, we had two thirds of the village homes were damaged. Uh, people had moved out, the businesses were boarded up. But you know, the community was in crisis. And we didn't sit around and say, woe is us. Um, the way we recovered by, was by coming together, by really rolling up our sleeves and working tirelessly to come up with, well, what's the future going to look like? What do we want our community to be? And how can we actually get that? And we created a plan. Each sector of that plan had a champion. Uh, we had a community-wide vote on this vision. Uh, 500 people participated, and we went after the dollars. We worked with the federal government, the state government, the local government. We passed a bond, and incredible things have come. Five years later, uh, we have an economy that is booming. Uh, we're a craft beer mecca that competes, I know, with other parts of our state, but we're really proud of that and what it's doing for our downtown, and not just that, new families moving to Waterbury. It's a place people want to be, and it's a place with a really bright future. That's what I want to do across Vermont, especially in areas that are challenged. So I'm hoping, too, you can clarify a little bit about what you mean by economic stimulus. There's obviously a number of different ways you can go about that. Grants, 
loans, uh, just capital infusions. When you're thinking economic stimulus for some of these communities, how do you plan on leveraging all those different options? That plan is going to come from the community. It's going to be based on what their assets and liabilities are. You have to understand your strengths and your weaknesses and what it's going to take to make that stimulus. Each community is going to have to figure that out. And we're going to have to come as a team, my cabinet, all in to help those three communities with leveraging the dollars that we have or that we know about. Some of it is philanthropic dollars that you have to apply for, but it's really understanding what the goal is and how we can get there. And for each, it's different. For some, it's going to be about infrastructure, like in Barrie. But for others, it might be, how can we really stimulate our creative economy? We've got great arts and culture opportunities. How can we take that to the next level? You know, I think a lot about uh, the circus ladies here in Brattleboro who have a beautiful vision of creating uh, the next Tanglewoods for circus performance, which could be a national treasure. Those are the champions, the people with real ideas that we can leverage. It's all about partnership and leveraging, but it's got to come from what the local opportunities are and who's ready to dig in and make it happen. Well, and then I wanted to ask how outside investment plays into that. A, a company thinking about relocating to Vermont, that certainly is something that some communities might find desirable, others might not. Uh, if you're talking about letting the community dictate it, how would a process like that work? Well, I think that's what it's about, bringing all of the players around the table together, those folks fo bringing in, trying to bring in new business, making sure it actually is leveraging sort of opportunities like here uh, in Brattleboro and Wyndham County, you're looking at the green building industry as an actual niche. Okay, you've got a plan around workforce, around green building, around education. Let's build that to the next level. Uh, leverage the state and federal dollars. Figure out where the, where the philanthropic dollars are work together as a team to make it happen. So there are communities that are already on their way for whom it might be a faster way to go. But there are other communities that need to come together uh, given certain crises. You know, I was in Newport the other day. Um, that's a community who has feels very deceived by what they envisioned as a bright future, which now feels uh, taken away from them. I want to use that crisis as an opportunity to turn that around. I want that community to have a plan for how will they develop the property in the middle of their downtown, which has been actually, the pre-development work has been done. It's actually a whole city block ready to go. Now they need to figure out what they want there. And I believe people will come when we, they see what Newport has to offer. I want to shift to education here. That's another plan that you put out. Vermont Promise, two years tuition free at Community College of Vermont or Vermont Technical College. A little bit I know about the state college system here is the dual enrollment program already allows high school students to accumulate something like up to 18 credits, basically a year of college tuition free. I'm wondering uh, if you think you could have actually pushed your plan a little bit more aggressively, maybe to include University of Vermont uh, or expanding it to more than just two years, since really what you're doing is a, seems to me at least, and there's probably some distinctions there that make it a slight dis difference of what's already available. Well, I think it's made very different from what's already available. You're right that we've passed programs to enable some students to actually get those credits and buy down their first two years. I wouldn't want anything to undermine that. But you have to look at who's taking advantage of those programs and then who we really need to target. And what the issue is, you know, that here in the 21st century, two-thirds of the jobs we know require some kind of education and training beyond high school. And while Vermont does a great job getting kids through high school among the highest high school graduation rates in the country, when it comes to continuing beyond high school, we drop to among the worst in the country. So four out of 10 kids are not going beyond getting that high school diploma. Four out of 10. We are doing a disservice if we don't do everything we can to get them over that hump. Now, for some kids, especially first generation uh, Vermont secondary, post secondary education, it takes a lot more. It takes breaking down the barriers. So, my Vermont promise is to both offer two years tuition free and 
link them up with a mentor. Someone will help with the application process, with the student aid uh, forms, and most importantly, be a champion to help them think not just about education, but the career afterwards. Because my goal isn't just to educate, it's actually to get kids ready for livable wage jobs, qualified for livable wage jobs, because, you know, I visit uh, businesses around this state, they can't find qualified workers. If we can get those kids who right now are ending their education at high school, who can't make ends meet, many of whom, you know, I've, I've talked with students around this state. You know, there was Amanda in Bennington who had $800 in student loans each month higher than her rent. There was a group of uh, young liberals in White River Junction who told me about their peers that didn't go on. Many of them uh, can't make ends meet, many of them turning to drugs, and most important for me is a sense that they didn't have hope for their future. They didn't have a track, a, a goal. That's why I wanna have kids who really aren't aspiring see that they can go beyond high school. They can be linked up with their champion and they can get a career with livable wage jobs because that's gonna help us both grow the economy and break the generational cycle of poverty which is growing throughout this country and here in Vermont. And that's a crisis we need to turn the corner on. And that's why I'm passionate about this issue. We've got to focus on educational attainment. Listen, we know that if you have an associate's degree, you earn on average $12,000 more per year. And if you have a bachelor's degree, $32,000 more per year. That's the opportunity that I want the next generation to have. That's my Vermont progress. So why not go as far enough as offering that bachelor's opportunity at some other schools? You talk about that four in 10 number of students. Uh, not all of them are gonna be wanting to go into the type of programs that are offered at VTC or at CCB, some of them might want to go to a, a, the university. And my program, of course, cuts their costs in half. So as long as you go through Vermont Promise, you can continue at UVM or any of the other state colleges. I'll tell you that my plan is one that I think we can achieve. Now, my opponents in this election have come up with their own plans. Uh, one doesn't really have a way to pay for it. Uh, the other has a plan that, frankly, is a regressive tax and something that we can't achieve for many years. Uh, and I have a plan that begins with two years tuition free by asking the big banks in our state to pay their fair share so that students can get a fair shake. And I believe that a plan that starts and is achievable is what I want to leave as my legacy. We will hope to be able to expand it from there, but let's start with a plan that is achievable, that focuses on the people who need it the most, and let's build from there. I want to ask you about something else that you brought up at the Wyndham County Democrat Committee's forum on June 6 that wasn't really a big issue at the time. Uh, so the media panel, we decided not to ask a question about it, but you brought it up in your closing remarks, and that has to do with gun legislation. Now, obviously, since that time, we've had the terrible, terrible massacre in Orlando at the Pulse nightclub. So gun restrictions and gun legislation is back in the news on a national level. You just use that term achievable. And that's really the question for me in a state like Vermont, uh, where hunting is part and parcel of the DNA of so many people in this state. What is achievable? in terms of coming to that compromise of people who want to see more restrictions on access to guns and people out there who don't think that there's a problem? So first, I think I want to say there is a problem. Uh, we have obviously uh, a gun epidemic in our country, and you mentioned Orlando. For me, uh, I began early on in my campaign uh, standing firm for gun, for common sense gun safety. And why? It's because when I first started, we had a mass shooting in a church in Charleston. And then we had Planned Parenthood. And after that, San Bernardino. And that's when I was asked my position. And I stated firmly, and I'm very proud to have been the first candidate to say, we need common sense, gun safety, specifically background checks for all guns. Now, at that time, the other candidates who were asked said our gun laws were fine. Uh, you may know that we have among the most lax gun laws in the state. Now listen, I want everyone to know that I strongly support the Second Amendment and Vermont's right, Vermonters' rights to own guns. I respect our hunting heritage. It's rich, it needs to continue and grow. 
But what I am saying is simply to say, let's have background checks just as we do at all Vermont federally licensed gun sales. Make sure we have those same background checks for all Vermont gun sales. And let me tell you why it's a problem in Vermont. You know, we often don't talk about it, but it's behind closed doors and it's about domestic violence. We have very high rates of domestic violence and the majority of our homicides in Vermont are domestic abuse related. Well, that's exactly, sorry to cut you off, but that's exactly one instance I was thinking of in a recent legislative session where they tried to pass some legislation restricting access to guns from people who were under restraining orders. And even a measure like that that seemed, again, common sense uh, was something that failed to pass. It's going to take time and it's going to take partnership. Uh, nothing passes overnight. And I really want to work very hard to allay the fears of so many that this is the beginning of them wanting to take our guns away. That is not my intent. My intent is to keep gun owners' rights, but take away the guns from those who are not safe to have them. And when I talk about the fact that we have, in 2013, we had the eighth highest rate of domestic homicides in the country, and the majority of those were with guns, and that in states where they have background checks on all handgun sales, we've seen a 46% fewer women shot to death, to death by their domestic partners. That demonstrates that common sense levels of, of just background checks can actually make a difference. And it's not only domestic violence, it's also suicides. We have in Vermont a very high rate of suicide. And I have a personal story. Uh, my daughter had a boyfriend in middle school who two weeks before their high school graduation took his life with a gun. It changed our community. It changed so many lives. And it could have been prevented if he hadn't had access to that gun. This happens more often than anyone wants to talk about. And we also know that with, in states with background checks, there's a significant reduction in suicides and actually in violence against uh, police officers. So we need to look holistically. We need to continue the discussion. And to be honest, and I know people are concerned, I hear a lot of negative response uh, daily on my page, but I also want to confront those discussions with honest understanding of what our intent is and what it is not. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you before we ran out of time here about the prospects of you being the state's second female governor, mm -hmm. first one since I was a teenager here in Brattleboro. Uh, and you are a product of Emerge Vermont, an uh, organization that does great work trying to get women more politically involved on all levels of government. Uh, you've got to be thinking about that as you go through this campaign as the example that you're setting. Well, I certainly am a product of Emerge Vermont, and I'm proud to have been on the advisory committee. And uh, certainly uh, having a role model of uh, uh, Madeline Cunin has meant an awful lot. And it's true. It's been 30 years since we had a woman governor, and we've only had one in over 200 years of history. But I'm not running because I'm a woman. I'm running because I'm the most qualified for this job. And I've got the passion, and I've got the vision, and yes, the experience to move Vermont forward. But I do think it's important to have more women in leadership, particularly in lead women's leadership. Uh, we all bring our own experience to the table. And democracy is about representation. And when half of the population is not adequately uh, represented in leadership, I think we're not getting all of the perspectives we need. You know, I'm not proud that I'm one of only two Democratic women in the country right now running for governor. That's not the right number. So I'm pleased to be a role model. Uh, nothing pleases me more than when I tell young girls that I'm running to be governor and their eyes get bigger, because I want them to know they can do anything. And I want to be that role model. And uh, I am inspired every day by the women who I meet in leadership, no matter what it is they do, whether it's those who are running the domestic violence uh, shelters, whether it's women, uh, incredible teachers, incredible administrators, incredible executive leaders. Um, and it does help uh, spur me on. But really, my goal is to be the best governor, uh, to be someone who listens, someone who thinks 
quite, uh, widely about uh, all of the issues that we're facing and really works to bring people together and get things done. I really appreciate your time with us today. It's an inspiration to travel around this beautiful state to meet so many Vermonters recognizing our challenges, but so many stepping up to solve them. And uh, I get energy from that, and I feel really privileged. So Thanks enjoy. so much for having me. Thank you very much. And thank you for tuning in. I want to remind you to visit BrattleboroTV.org to check for airtimes, as well as the on-demand version of this episode. And also want to remind everybody that the primary elections are August 9th, and early voting is now available. Go to your town clerk's office for a ballot. Thank you.